Today on the Visionary Chronicles, we're going to talk about another visionary, Andrew Carnegie. We talked earlier about John D. Rockefeller and these early generational entrepreneurs and visionaries that were able to create a market from nothing. And it truly goes back to what a lot of companies today try to find that magic bullet around finding something that people never knew they needed, wanted, or had. And certainly Carnegie falls into that classification of visionary. And when he came to this country from Scotland, um, he saw an opportunity to learn from others. And what's interesting about Carnegie and what I find intriguing with him is that he was humble enough to understand that first, I need to learn from others and find out how they have built their empire from the ground up. And so what he did, he had an interest in railways at the time, and that was fairly new as well. John D. Rockefeller was here on the oil side. J.P. Morgan was the king of banking and had a lot of influence in many industries. And so what Carnegie saw was an opportunity to expand upon the railway business. And when he came over from Scotland, he actually partnered up with Thomas Scott. He was only 18 years old, and he was very much wanting to learn the industry itself from the inside out. And so Carnegie learned very early on that in order for him to overcome wins and losses and failures inside a business, you understand you have to first understand others who have been down that path already. So when you look at true visionaries, those that have successfully built what I call an empire, an empire that lasts for generations and an empire that was never there before they discovered it. And certainly Carnegie, when he looked at the opportunity to build his business, wanted to start and learn from those who had already been successful. And Thomas Scott was definitely one of those individuals. He was a leader in the railway business and one that Carnegie knew he could learn very much from, even though it was in a different industry. He certainly felt that Thomas Scott had built this from the ground up and had taken on these other powerful players in the industry, such as Rockefeller. So what a, what a great learning experience this is. And I mention this because those that are looking to either build a new category of business in, in the current environment that we're in, find an opportunity in crisis. And, you know, that's another thing that we'll talk about is that when you were going through this phase in the Industrial Revolution, none of this was available before. Before these visionaries discovered these different product categories that, quite frankly, people didn't know they needed or wanted. And very few of these come along in our lifetime. And it's interesting to look back on the evolution of how did the steel industry evolve? How did the oil industry evolve? How did we build the railway system? All of these things are keys and verticals in a transportation and logistics industry we enjoy today, even to this day. You look at railroad tracks, they're still the same as what Thomas Scott put down um, over a century ago. So when you look at these visionaries and Andrew Carnegie, he learned from others first. And then secondly, when he was learning from others, and this is where he built his business from, is that he was able to find a niche in the industry, something that he felt would be useful. And this turned out to be steel. And so when he looked at the opportunity, he actually had other investors that came on board, believed in the idea that Carnegie had in being able to build this steel industry in the U.S., and was able to successfully capitalize on it. So the first thing is to learn from others who have been through the process that you're going to be going through. And the second is to find this niche. You can either find a niche or you can find a brand new category of business, which currently does not exist. Although very difficult, even in the environment we're in today, you'll see year after year, those that are what I call making a better mousetrap, those that are doing incremental improvements to a product that's already in the marketplace, or you see those 
that are making a new mousetrap. Those like an Andrew Carnegie or John D. Rockefeller that had the vision of what this product is, how it can be used, where it would be used, and built an industry around that. That's extremely difficult to do. And the third thing that Carnegie did, along with learning from others, finding the niche, he knew that he needed to partner with people that would fund his idea. So he really had to convey this vision of what he wanted to achieve through the what is now the steel industry to others. Can you imagine having to go out to a banker, in this case, a J.P. Morgan, um, partnering with a John D. Rockefeller, and explaining this new category of business that doesn't exist and how you're going to be able to not only capitalize on the opportunity, but be able to define the industry and then build a user base for that industry to drive revenue. So you can imagine the challenge that Andrew Carnegie had to go out and convince others of this new market opportunity. And every one of us have had to do it as entrepreneurs. Not necessarily a new category business, which is the ultimate or the hardest presentation to make to investors in convincing them of your vision. Steve Jobs does it. Andrew Carnegie was able to do it. John D. Rockefeller was able to do it. And so what he had to do is he had to go out and find partners. Um, you know, Carnegie wasn't by design brought up wealthy. He actually was one that built his wealth through the steel industry and business that eventually it is what it is today. And now is the U.S. steel that J.P. Morgan had taken over. So when you look at Carnegie, he didn't have the money to build this industry. So he had to set the vision, partner up with those that had the money and be able to grow this business effectively from scratch. So you look at where our Andrew Carnegie was, what he built and the legacy that he's left behind is phenomenal. And when Carnegie was doing this, he also felt that he needed to make friends of his enemies. You know, he didn't necessarily have enemies at the time, but he certainly had people that he wanted to keep close. And he said, keep your friends close, your enemies closer. So when you look at that, and even in today's environment, you need people that are effectively what people would classify as your enemy. Some point when Apple was getting its legs back with Steve on board, he had to partner with what most people call the enemy at the time, which is Microsoft. So even in the industry we're in today, you'll see many companies partnering with those that will further their cause within their product category. So keeping your friends closer, your enemies closer is an adage that still works today. So when Andrew Carnegie started his steel business, it was in 1885. So 1885 through 1900, you can imagine over a 15 year time frame, a decade and a half, he was building the steel empire through a need that nobody knew they had to have. So this was in the horse and buggy era, and really it brought in the foundation for Henry Ford to start building his automobile empire. So kind of the byproduct, which you see with the steel industry, is we wouldn't have bridges today, we wouldn't have cars today. So what's really cool about these visionaries is that what they build as a product can be utilized as a byproduct or a core for other categories to build their business from. Automobile industry, the bridge industry, um, the buildings that we're in on a daily basis are all built off a of foundation of steel and foundry that Carnegie had invented back in 1885 and built his empire through 1900. So it took him quite a while to build his empire, learning from Thomas Scott in the very beginning finding this niche and partnering with others that would help him build and grow this business. Now, he certainly had a lot of failures along the way, but he was able to overcome those failures and learn from them. Andrew Carnegie was a very humble person, and he also believed very much in family, and he was very much in touch with his foundational upbringing from Scotland. So he was an interesting visionary because a lot of times he was away from his business, and in the book that that I read, which would be a great book for you to read if you're interested in Carnegie, was one of his best um, 
bi- autobiographies or biographies from David Nassa is that he was very much back and forth between his business in the U.S. and Scotland. And there was a lot of things going on in the industry at the time. And when he had to deal with unions, when you have to deal with how do I grow, build my business, find these right partnerships, ones that you'll find more enemies than friends. And how do you continue to grow your business? So from 1885 to 1900, he built this unbelievable empire from scratch. And to this day, we're the beneficiaries of it. And back when he was building this, Carnegie's passion when he was building his empire was to eventually give it all away, which is also an interesting dynamic. What I love about Carnegie and as as well as Rockefeller is that, and you'll even find it with our visionaries today, is that one of their primary purposes is to give back. And Carnegie absolutely set the standard along with John D. Rockefeller as to giving back from what has been so graciously given to you over the years. So when you look at Andrew Carnegie and building this empire, he built it up to just the interesting statistic with this is that he built this empire and sold it to J.P. Morgan, who we're all familiar with on the banking industry inside. J.P. Morgan was the most influential banker of his day and actually kept the nation afloat through depression and, and through banking crises and was probably the most influential banker in the country and actually partnered up with Thomas Edison to assist him in, in building his electrical empire as well. So obviously he was looking for a business that was sustainable one that was growing, and then one that he could control the vast market share in the country. And effectively, Carnegie had the majority market share in the country at the time. And so in 1901, he actually sold his business to J.P. Morgan for $480 million. And and at the time, when you convert that to dollars today, I think it's over almost $400 uh, billion that he sold it for. So when you look from where Andrew Carnegie came from, very humble upbringings, very humble on how he got into the business, found an opportunity, capitalized on it, and grew it to majority market share that had the value at the time of $480 million to J.P. Morgan. He became the richest man in the world with an estimated net worth, now get this, in 1901, of 300, in today's dollars, $309 billion. And Bezos, to this day, is, I think, a little over $200 billion and growing day after day with Amazon. Um, But the interesting thing with with Carnegie is he never really looked back. He regretted it for a little bit, as most visionaries do. But he had kind of been at the end of his rope. His next stage in his life, which is interesting when you talk to visionaries and those that have made a tremendous amount of money, is those that leave a legacy are the ones that are remembered. And when Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, they knew, and it wasn't their primary purpose, but they knew they needed to leave a legacy because of how they have been so blessed with this foundation and this money and being able to build a market and providing value to others that they could give generously back. And so... What you'll find today, even with Carnegie and with Rockefeller, many buildings, many foundations that are still going today that are benefiting from their success. So another big part of being a visionary, being someone who has been very successful, and what I love about these stories is give back if you've been successful. Give back to others that have helped you in building your company, building your brand, And that will pay back dividends way beyond you could imagine. So Carnegie gave almost every bit of his wealth back. Can you imagine giving back 300, almost 309, $10 billion in wealth? Not a lot of people are willing to do that and they die miserably. I can tell you Rockefeller and Carnegie passed away very happy knowing that they pleased so many people while they were alive. They accumulated much, but gave back even more. So 
when I look at these visionaries and look at you in particular, if you have been successful, giving back is something that is part of your purpose. And so when you look at making money, establishing a foundation for growth, building the brand, building your company, partnering with others along the way, and understanding all of your wealth is built off the backs of others that have been there for you. And Carnegie and Rockefeller understood that. So when you look at the end of days with these two visionaries within the oil and steel industry, a life well lived is exactly what these two have done. So when you look at visionaries and you look at the Andrew Carnegie's of the world, humility is an important aspect of their life. They learn from others and appreciate and give back to those who help them get where they are. And they found an opportunity. They found a niche. But they also understood that they needed people around them or that were smarter than them in order to execute their vision. Steve Jobs was that way. And they partner with others that are visionaries and those that can understand the vision that they put before people so they can convey that and help them bring that to reality. So Andrew Carnegie, a very interesting visionary and one that today his legacy is still intact and has given back and in so many ways has benefited so many people. So going beyond your company, your product, your brand is then leaving a legacy or what visionaries are all about. I want to thank you for listening to the Visionary Podcast today. I really appreciate your time. And I hope you enjoy the subjects that we're bringing up here with the Visionary Chronicles. It's more diversified, talked about business strategy, areas of support that you need in functional areas, but also on the personal side. There's a lot of things that you deal with as an entrepreneur, small business owner, manager, or executive. So we want to make sure we're addressing those as well. So if you like the content, I just wanted to kind of put something out there that hopefully uh, you could join or subscribe to the Visionary Podcast, or at least give us a shout out on the rating. We'd really appreciate it. Um, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, Pandora. And for those that do give us a rating, um, we're also going to be doing some giveaways. We'll have some t-shirts, some different stickers, uh, some rings that we're giving out, some super cool rings on the Visionary side. Um, and different subjects. If you've got some subjects you would like us to talk about, you can see when I, I introduce the, the podcast each week uh, that these usually come from our listeners on a subject area of concern with them or area that they would like me to talk about. Um, and also, we're going to be starting our interviews. And if there's anybody out there, um, we've got about 10 lined up right now. We have uh, former executives from Action Sports Industry, Sporting Good Industry, Ones that you'll find very intriguing. We're going to have also some graphic designers uh, that will be joining the podcast as well. So if you've got an idea of some people we might want to interview, I'd certainly appreciate it. 